Rotorua Airport awaits the arrival of the first Air New Zealand 737 since the jet service was cancelled back in 2002. As it comes into land, the aircraft will pass 50 metres or so directly over the Ruamata Marae and the Kura belonging to Ngāti Uanuku Kopaka. The noise, though brief, will be considerable. The sound of low-flying aircraft is a condition the hapu have lived with ever since Rotorua's airport was shifted from the old aerodrome or Fenton Street back in the 1960s. The new airport, officially opened with great fanfare in October 1964, was hailed at the time as a major advance for the city. Largely forgotten by the crowds enjoying opening day was the fact that the new airport had been constructed on land taken under the Public Works Act. Much of it traditionally belonging to Ngāti Uanuku Kopako. Almost exactly 40 years on, and with the prospect of an increased jet service in the future, Ruamata Marae is again in the firing line. Their representatives have just been invited to the last of five District Council public airport consultation meetings here at the Ofota Marae. The hosts are the Tiroro o Tarangi Hapu, and as the Daily Post reports, things haven't gone well. The meeting is supposed to be about the runway extension and flight path designations to the south of the airport. There have already been years of long-standing inter-hapu disagreements over the airport redevelopment. Not for the first time, robust argument threatens to come to blows. And the meeting is abandoned. Martin Lobb is another finding Christmas cheer in short supply. His Polynesian spa is well attended as ever, but a dark cloud remains following the death of a patron back in May. Hydrogen sulphide poisoning is suspected, and although eight of the outdoor pools have been closed to the public, and a coroner's report is still awaited, now comes the news that the Occupational and Health Safety Authorities intend to proceed with the prosecution over the spa's handling of that unfortunate event. Simon Earle is preparing a story for the next edition of the Rotorua Review. For what is basically a two-man reporting team, freebies are few and far between at the Review, but Simon scored a trip on the first flight of the restored jet service and the unaccustomed luxury of three abreast seating for a change. There was a bit of a fanfare uh, when, when the reintroduction happened and there was a special plane went down uh, to, uh, to Christchurch uh, full of uh, uh, local body politicians and tourism heads and business heads and of course the media tagged along for the, uh, for the experience as well. Uh, I think from memory the, um, uh, the plane left uh, in jets of water, there was a bit of uh, champagne flowing and of course uh, we flew down to Christchurch and uh, uh, we're welcomed there by the Mayor of Christchurch, uh, Gary Moore, and, um, uh, and basically had about half an hour in Christchurch and, and flew back home again. But uh, it was all sort of uh, an exercise in promoting the fact that the, uh, the jets uh, were back on track and of course uh, uh, the media had a role to play in, um, uh, in getting that back out uh, in the public. In the first week of December, the Daily Post reports on progress in the plans to clean up Lake O'Carrica's water. In fact, with another summer coming on, there seems to be considerable pressure being applied to get their ideas into action without delay. Top of the list is the requirement to begin retiring as much of the surrounding farmland as quickly as possible. And the plan includes a proposal placing quite draconian limits on what can be done even with the humble lifestyle block. When the Regional Council decided which lake would be the first to have one of these catchment management action plans, that they chose Okaraka because the, the water quality wasn't good and there was a risk of it 
uh, becoming much worse over a short period of time because there is a tipping point which a, a lake can reach and it's a whole lot easier to stop it reaching that point than to try and reverse the process later. Uh, also there had been a certain amount of research done on this lake and uh, there was talk of a, a sewerage scheme and I think it was possibly also the existence of, of a, a, a well-organised uh, community which they, they could uh, enlist the support of. Despite the call to get things moving, it's clear that most of these restorative processes will take time. But using science may provide a quicker result, trialling ways to directly cleanse the water and lake bed of excess nutrients. This is about to start at one of the most seriously afflicted bodies of water. Lake Okaro, near Rainbow Mountain, is being used to see how effective the applications of chemicals are in counteracting high nutrient levels. Back in the city, another talk fest is about to get underway. A public meeting has been called by the Bay Rugby Union and Mayor Hall in an effort to find a solution to the problem of too many empty seats at the International Stadium. Despite being considered one of the best multi-purpose venues in the country, there have now been two seasons of low spectator turnouts. A Daily Post editorial points out that this could turn out to be an examination of the very future of grassroots rugby in the city, and the last chance to establish a new successful formula. Certainly things seem very different from the heady period around 2000, when the stadium revamp was just getting underway. However, in 2003, Steve Chadwick's political career as Rotorua's MP is on the rise. She may have suffered humiliating failure to secure Easter trading for the city, but now she's chairing the powerful Health Committee and has seen her anti-smoking bill pass through all its hearings. In December, it's become law, banning smoking in pubs, clubs and casinos. But it hasn't been an easy ride. In Wellington, Steve Chadwick has received what are described as death threats and certainly some bitter opposition from some in the community she represents. The RSA absolutely loathed me. Citizens Club were civil, but the RSA, they, they had a fighting fund, don't you remember? They had a fighting fund, they were going to take me to, they were going to, take me to the Court of Appeal over this and um, I just kept going in the quietest way, saying it'll be all right, you'll be able to smoke, but it'll be outside. No, I took it on, and I was proud to take it on. It was horrible. It's the beginning of the second week of December, and the release of details for one of the year's biggest stories is perfectly timed for the Daily Post's Monday edition. The headline contains just six words. The front page story outlines just what the government is putting on the table as a resolution to more than a century of Tiarawa grievances over ownership of the Rotorua lakes. Given the long-standing local concerns about what the deal might mean, Coupled with recent widespread unease over the implications of Māori claims for the foreshore and seabed, both parties to the Tiarawa settlement appear to have taken pains to make assurances that the existing public rights of access to the lakes will be preserved. On the record, for those who have long and vigorously campaigned for maintaining the status quo of Crown ownership, such reassurances cut no ice, and a principle remains. So that that's been the position all the time, is to try and make sure that this country does not go down the path that many other nations have gone down with the issue of ethnic privilege 
and the trouble that that brings. But the Daily Post takes an affirming tone, including opinion from a respected local historian, Don Stafford, regarding the injustice of the original settlement concluded back in 1922. He calls this one of the greatest days in Rotorua history. It is absolutely imperative that we understand the past if we are to predict the future. Of what would have escaped many Daily Post readers is a story that on any other day might have made the headlines. Tucked away on page 9 is an article that provides food for thought. Surprisingly, figures in a new survey have shown that for the first time, the Western Bay of Plenty is more than matching Rotorua in visitor numbers. The big increase is in domestic visitors to the region, mainly from Auckland and the Waikato, and they're staying in private accommodation rather than hotels and motels. These guest nights add up to more than double Rotorua's, and indicate the growing pulling power of the beach environment of our near neighbour. As Christmas approaches, there are signs that Rotorua has joined the latest trend to make a festive display. Dozens of homes have been illuminated and family crowds have started doing the rounds to view the spectacle around the various suburbs. There's no fairy lights out of the Waipa Mill, but there might well be. In mid-December comes the news that almost a year after being put up for sale, the mill has been bought as a going concern. The new owners are a consortium of business people who claim to be keen to maintain the present operation with no staff layoffs. A welcome early Christmas present then for all working at the Waipa Mill. City, the tempo of shopping is in full swing. The mood is buoyant and retailers seem happy. At the District Council there's been a flurry of end of the year activity. Coming into effect almost immediately a new liquor control bylaw will prohibit drinking on central city streets. At the same meeting a new prostitution bylaw was also passed and there's been a review of new restrictions on gambling. If this gets approved, there will be a limit placed on the number of pokies in town, almost a hundred less than there are at present. While the Daily Post reminds its readers that summer must be here, the algal warning signs have gone up at Okawa Bay. For Ian Edward and his girls' high school arena committee, there's been better news. Their kitty for the building gets a massive boost with a $1.1 million gift from the government. And just as the people of Rotorua are starting to put the old year to bed in the usual way, comes the news of a well-deserved award. Mayor Graham Hall has just been recognised for a job well done with the Queen's Service Order. Bring on the new year, 2004.